Nepal in crisis. The constitution about to expire and there are no signs of political agreement about replacing it. What's behind the dangerous stalemate and what is going to happen next? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Nepal's political leaders have been locked in a series of marathon meetings attempting to avert a crisis that could throw the country into political and civil chaos. When the country's parliament or constitutional assembly was elected in 2008, it was tasked with drawing up a new constitution within two years. That period's about to expire, and there's no new constitution in view. Joining us now are our guests. In London, Kana Shahi, he's uh, chairman of the Progressive Nepalese Society in the UK. Also in London, Lauren says he's an associate, uh, associate professor of politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And in Kathmandu, Santosh Shah, he hosts the Nepali TV program Power Talks and is the editor of Youth Asia magazine. Let's begin with Kana Shahi in London. This is only its second an uh, anniversary, and yet the republic seems to be under real threat. All of political parties, including, you know, of course, you know, uh, those parties who are in government and, uh, you know, opposition party, must work hard together to build, you know, consensus that, you know, they can draft constitution in time. See, so in this case, I do believe, you know, uh, government you know, must be more responsible to bring all of, you know, political parties, especially main opposition party, so that they can work together. See, otherwise, you know, I think there will be some problem. Santa Shah and Kathmandu, uh, doesn't appear that the politicians are getting any closer together, the talks as yet not producing any result. In the last three weeks, there has been several talks within the parties and among the parties and most of the meetings have come without a conclusion. Tomorrow is the deadline of the two years of the timeline given for the constitution drafting. Tomorrow they will come out with a consensus, but not that with the drafting of the constitution, but uh, unanimously both the parties in the government and in the opposition will sign for an extension of six months, uh, which they can legitimize through voting themselves in. But a larger question will stay whether the people are going to accept that who voted them only for two years. So agreement uh, reached. The opposition had been insistent that there would be no extension unless the prime minister stepped down. The prime minister has no reason or has no uh, enough opposition to force him to resign. There was a movement uh, done by the Maoists throughout the country, especially in Kathmandu from May 1st, and that didn't deter the prime minister even by an inch. Uh, the prime minister has lost elections from two constituency for this constitution assembly. And at the same time, he has been facing a lot of alienation from within his own party. Yet he holds a very powerful position in the country. So it is clear that the prime minister has certain unnatural power with which he has retained himself. And that's not going to buzz tomorrow in the next 24 hours. Lawrence says we're dealing here in effect with the unprecedented. We are dealing with a new interim constitution, a uh, republic that is only two years old, and talk about a constitution that was supposed to have been written over the past 24 months. Yes, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure that it's unprecedented in Nepalese politics, because Nepalese politics are filled with examples of deadlocks of this type. Uh, it's also not unprecedented in other countries, uh, such as Bangladesh, where you have very disparate uh, perspectives on what the solution would be. So. I think that the, in the case of Nepal, it was implicit, um, I was there a few weeks ago, that there would be an agreement uh, to, to extend the, 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 the period by six months, which is what has happened. And uh, the, the problem then becomes is what's going to happen in six months. Uh, I happen to have very negative uh, or pessimistic perspectives on what is likely to happen in six months. Namely, it will be in the same situation that we are in right now, trying to, to have meetings at the last minute and no resolution in mind. And so my, and my concern would be uh, at what point will the military step in to, to put uh, an end to this? Kana Shahi in London, let's uh, put that to you. 
Is there a threat that the military could step in at some stage? Uh, I don't know, but, you know, if that will uh, happen, you know, that will be, you know, Oh, honestly, you know, masses, you know, people will, you know, will not tolerate that one anymore. Any kind of threat, you know, which, uh, you know, you know, that threat, you know, threat for the republic, for people's achievement, you know, if any forces, not just, I'm not talking about any particular forces, any kind of forces which, you know, uh, you know, threats, you know, which, you know, undermines the people's achievement, you know, that kind of threat, you know, will be, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, you know challenged by all sorts of means, I think. So Santa, I don't think so people will you know, tolerate that one. Santa Shah, let's uh, pick up on that particular point. What is the mood in Nepal? What, how are the people feeling? They've, this is now the 10th government in 10 years. Is there a sense of despair, of desperation, of political disillusion? Absolutely. People are really nervous and worried right now, as you can see from my own face. Uh, we are very nervous because from tomorrow onwards, there is a larger question of uncertainty. And I would also like to touch slightly upon the Nepal army taking over. The probabilities are very less. I mean, it's a chance. There is, there is a chance that they, it could be an option, but I don't see that as a possibility. Because if we look at the history of Nepal army, they have positioned themselves always neutrally. Even when, when they were robbed of the title royal, from Royal Nepalese Army to Nepalese Army, it, they did it very smoothly. There was no opposition from their side. And uh, they're very clear about staying out of the politics. Last year, when the then Prime Minister Prachanda messed up with the whole army issue of ousting the chief of army over some mundane reasons, uh, even then the Maoists didn't make any move, which was kind of uh, looked at. So there is no question of pe people not accepting the army's move because they're not going to move at all. Lawrence Sayers, I see that you are shaking your head there. Do you not agree with this? Well, it's not a matter of agreement. It's a matter, I mean, when I speak to individuals in Nepal, of course I can't tell you who, but namely people who are connected to the military, uh, the mood within the military ranks, especially among the top leaders, is to actually take over at some point. Uh, they're trying to make a decision as to when that's going to happen. Obviously, right now it would be too premature to do so because the conditions are not uh, intolerable enough uh, for, that, for that takeover to be successful. Uh, but the, 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 you know, the chiefs of the army uh, and the armed forces are, are quite keen uh, to, to determine when they're likely to, to take over, um, probably in some form of bloodless coup very similar to what happened uh, a few years ago in Bangladesh. I think that's the model they're looking at, where they would dissolve the government, try to hold an interim uh, place, uh, in, and then call elections eventually. That's what's going to happen in, in, in Nepal, uh, mostly uh, as a result because the, the, the Maoists are likely to uh, react very negatively at some point. I mean, they, will, they, they have staged a, lot of, a number of protests, but they're also talking about uh, retraining the cadres, that takes about six months or so to actually uh, to, to bring back fighters to a position where they can fight uh, successfully against the armed forces. Um, so the armed forces are aware of this uh, of this retraining that is going on, and so at some point they will they will step in. I mean, they, I, I have no doubts about that. Unfo it's a, a mis it will be unfortunate, but it, it will be it will happen. Let's just pause here and put this discussion into context. The 11th hour talks happening in Nepal are the result of years of political upheaval. It all started in 1995 when the Maoists launched a violent campaign aimed at abolishing the monarchy. A decade's conflict ended by what is called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, or CPA, in 2006. The following year, former Maoist rebels became a part of the political mainstream by joining the interim government. In 2008, the Constituent Assembly was set up with the Maoists winning the bulk of the seats. Monarchy was abolished and Nepal was declared a federal democratic republic. In 2009, though, the Maoists left the government after other parties opposed former rebel fighters joining the National Army. Since then, they've been in the opposition, uh, carrying out strikes, for example, in an attempt to oust the ruling coalition government. The question to Santos Shah, uh, should this government step down, and importantly, would it? 
the thing is they only have 24 hours next in next 24 hours they need to sit down in the constitution assembly and decide whether they have a drafted constitution or not which in reality they don't have and then the question comes what to do with this constitution assembly who is going to complete uh, tomorrow and as i mentioned earlier there, there will be a consensus from both sides in the government and the opposition to extend it by six months and then the question comes what, how the new government will be formed uh, there's another issue that nobody has raised so far is if there's a six months of extension what is this what is going to be the size of the government uh, of the constitution assembly which is 601 right now i don't think the government has the fund or the mechanism uh, from saturday onwards which basically means if they don't have funds to uh, salary 601 members and a mechanism to do so there's a good probability that there will be a downsize in the number if there's a downsize in the number the conflict which exists in the country right now will sift inside the assembly of the constitution as who is going to take an exit which nobody probably will want to because each one of them are paid more than 300 to 400 dollars per month which is a huge salary in nepal but to downsize so the assembly would mean a constitutional amendment which would require the two-thirds majority which is unable to be obtained at this particular point so we're back to square one aren't we santosh shah exactly exactly the, the, there's a good probability that the number may be downsized to 101 or even lesser and that's that's another conflict that i see within the players the within the political players Lauren Shah uh, says, we are looking at um, talking about the improbable, the impossible. Uh, simply, we do not know. To go back to your earlier point that you made, um, this is just going to extend dispute for six months and put it off for six months. Do you believe there's no likelihood whatsoever that there will be political movement during this period? Just there, ha there, has, there has not been in the past uh, 24 months. Uh, I mean, I think the past is a good predictor of what's going to happen over the next six months. Namely, this is, this is a, a situation where a political um, resolution is not going to happen. It will be a military re resolution, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, as, as I was emphatically mentioning before, the, the military will take over, uh, I mean, ho hopefully not, but by November. Uh, if not, the, the Maoist, uh, former Maoist rebels, will rise up at some point. Um, and that was likely to happen within a year of now. So one of the other two situations is the, the most likely outcome. Um, I mean, most of the, the problems with, with for, uh, former Maoist rebels, I mean, most of them, uh, when you speak to them, they, they really don't want to go back to fighting. It's really not a comfortable life for them. Uh, it is preferable to, to be in, in peace as they are now. And they're very skeptical of the leadership, of the Maoist leadership, uh, while they were in government. They think that they, they failed to achieve anything. And so compensating them is one of the key problems right now as well. It's a, it's a third problem or fourth. I mean, you could add on uh, different types of problems. And most of it is a, is a debate about how much to compensate them, how to compensate them, how many of them to compensate them. But the bottom line is that the military is vehemently uh, opposed to having the Maoist uh, fighters uh, incorporated into the armed forces uh, on the basis of, no of number of things not the least that, uh, that the, the former Maoist uh, insurgents um, have very low educational level, for instance. And so they will not be able to come into the armed forces to be integrated at the same rank that they were fighting uh, before. Uh, the former Ma Maoist insurgents had a facility in terms of waging a guerrilla war, but not a, in a conventional sense uh, to be f uh, f uh, part of, of, of a formal armed forces, you know, where you have to, to, do, uh, to act differently. And so, for all these circumstances that we mentioned before, there will be no resolution uh, of anything, of any type. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's it, but it is the case. I mean, in some countries, like in this one where I live, uh, the liberal Democrats and conservatives, people of different stripes, politically can agree to, the, to do these things, to join government. But it's not going to happen in Nepal, unfortunately. Santa Shah, uh, we have heard a very insistent uh, Lauren Sayers saying that the military is going to get involved having listened to him are you uh, thinking about changing your mind no because we should not forget that two years ago we also appointed uh, the first president of nepal so if there's a crisis the first person or the ultimate person who should respond to this is going to be the president and now maoists were in the power when president yadav was appointed or voted in as the president
So they were very clear about not giving enough executive powers to him uh, because he was earlier former from the opposition party. Now, it, dep it depends how much power the president wants to exercise or wants to pull in in a situation of emergency or in situation of chaos when public sympathy will ultimately go to him. And if we look at his uh, track of one and a half to two years, it's been pretty smooth. He has always stood for a national integrity and people have developed a lot of faith and love for him. And that is, that is the strength uh, that we have not used or even thought of exercising so far. And this may come into action if a situation like that arises. We should not also forget that international community has taken strong interest in Nepal, and they have a strong footing now since uh, then King Ganendra took power in 2003 and then took absolute power in 2005. That's the time when a lot of international uh, bodies, uh, several governments took a stronger interest in Nepal. They are not going to stay quiet, and they are not quiet even right now. Uh, so we should not forget all these other major political and power players that exist besides the current government and the Maoists. Lawrence, in addition to that, uh, rule of law in Nepal... Lawrence Sires, um, we heard there the words uh, emergency rule, we heard there the word president perhaps um, uh, uh, presiding over it. Is the president of the two-year-old republic powerful enough to be able to maintain a stability should the occasion arise of an emergency period? No, I, obviously the response will be no, but he's more powerful than the former prime minister, the Maoist prime minister, Pachanda. Uh, so, but it, it, you have, we have to consider that, that Nepal is a failed state. So we're talking really about a failed state trying to do something together. The only uh, presence of the state that you, you can see in Nepal are, is the military. That's, that's really the, the only presence that you find of the state uh, credible. Uh, the rest is, is uh, th there's no prestige to, to any of the politicians, um, not to the level that, that uh, the former speaker was talking about. People are partial to, to one ideology or the other, but the one thing that we have to also keep in mind that there was a former king, and the former king has not, uh, has been silent for the most part, but he appears to be in complete denial that he's no longer the king. Um, I am aware that, that he, he feels like that, and the military, perhaps, I mean, if, if, I, if my prediction is correct, if and when they take over um, through a coup, uh, they will most likely go to him and uh, reinstate him in some form, uh, possibly as a, uh, an provisional government figure. Uh, and that's, that's the situation. Well, Sadly, the situation um, there, uh, they're very clearly, very complicated, a deposed king, an army on the sidelines and up to 20,000 former rebels in various parts of the country. Many thanks to our guests, Kana Shahi and Lawrence Saves in London and Santos Shah in Kathmandu. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.